students welcome to this session of massive open online course on international economics in today's session we will discuss non traded goods and dutch disease the title of this lecture today's analysis is very interesting if you look at this title it has a word that perhaps known to you because of football dutch dutch the name goes with the netherlands why the name of a particular country is associated with trade theory that you will be amazed to know and i'm pretty sure that you will enjoy how this name is associated with this analysis and can land up with some interesting implications for trade theory this analysis in a sense is a continuation of our previous module in our previous module what we did we did that there is a kind of structure in the economy that is not like ricardian structure if it is not like ricardian structure then what kind of structure it is and we explained in great detail that the structure that we have in reality which is not in line with ricardian model but very much in line with our day to day life is specific factor model there is another kind of framework which is very popular in international trade theory that we will discuss in another module which is popularly known as hosv structure what is hosv structure hosv structure stands for hecksher olin samuelson vanek structure the abbreviated version is hosv we also call it hos structure or hecksher olin structure now before we jump into that structure we need to find out a missing link and you'll be amazed to know that this is also very close to the reality the previous model that i said is specific factor model is a reflection of realistic production structure there is another structure which is very realistic you will get to know the moment i tell you what is what the point is that it is not guaranteed that all the goods we consume are traded means say there is a commodity apple you can produce at home you can buy the same apple from another country there is a bicycle you can produce at home you can buy the bicycle from abroad but what happens to the service that you are getting from the doctor that very service can you buy from abroad at that moment sitting over here probably no the restaurant service you want to go there you want to sit and eat can you buy that service that you want to have in your city from another country no there may be some goods which are non traded say the tokri made of bamboo which is not exported and this bamboo tokri is not imported but we consume it there could be a kind of product that is very much domestic and indigenous nobody knows about the name that is very much produced locally it could be rice of a particular type that is locally produced and locally prepared it could be a kind of preparation that you eat that is very much local in nature that is neither exported nor imported this means this is not traded then what kind of good it is the name that we can tag with that good is it is non traded good so we will add this non traded good with the specific factor model so it is an extension of the previous module the previous model to incorporate 
another realistic phenomenon that we have in our daily life. The question is why there is non-traded goods? There could be a bunch of reasons. I will mention a few in my next slide. And then we will figure out how the coexistence of traded and non-traded goods are there in the system. If these two goods, two type of goods coexist, then what should be the pattern of equilibrium? What is the driving force of that equilibrium? That we will also explore. And then we will come to the point that I mentioned at the very beginning. Dutch disease. It is a disease. But why Dutch? Is it true that this, this disease is only in Dutch in the Netherlands? Or this kind of phenomenon we may experience in any country? And that too in India as well. We will touch upon that as well. So, what is going to happen to the economy? Is there any relationship between the existence of specific factor model, the existence of non-traded good, and the open economy macroeconomics? What is open economy macroeconomics? Open economy macroeconomics talks about the exchange rate, talks about the stock market, talks about the balance of payment, talks about the export-import current account balance, capital account balance, and all those things. And while doing this thing, I will take you back to a concept that I introduced at the very beginning. And you'll be amazed to know that that very concept is still there in our analysis. The concept is mercantilism. Students, I'm pretty sure that you remember this word. Hold on for some time. I will use again that very concept in respect of this Dutch disease. So this non-traded goods referred to those goods which are not traded between countries. So it is neither exported nor imported. But traded goods, as I said, these are essentially traded. And then, you know, the thing is that the Dutch disease essentially, when it is tagged with non-traded goods, it may indicate something else which is beyond the idea of international trade theory that we also need to explore in this analysis, in this module. And while doing that thing, we will also talk about something like in a booming sector and contracting sector or another phenomenon that goes very much with the Ricardian idea of complete specialization. The another name of this kind of phenomenon is called finite change in international trade or vanishing sector argument. One sector may vanish. And that is also the implication of Dutch disease. And why Dutch disease? Because Dutch disease problem was first explained with reference to the development of new natural gas fields in the Netherlands. What was the implication? That I'll explain. And the resultant contraction of the traded manufacturing sector. So that is an alarming kind of implication of the existence of Dutch disease in the economy. So existing system may have some sort of shock because of the emergence of a new sector. How? That is the main target of this module. So why the existence of non-traded sector? One by one. There is no demand for that commodity outside the country for a certain good. If internationally people are reluctant to buy this good, then there is no question of exporting that good. But if I produce that good, I need to sell this good. And if I produce that good, there are some go uh, consumers who are consuming it. If international consumers are not consuming, then who is consuming? Definitely they are the domestic consumers. If the good is domestically produced, domestically sold, domestically purchased, domestically consumed, that is non-traded in a sense, and that is, if the cost of transportation of the good is prohibitive, prohibitive means it is exorbitantly high, because the moment you want to send this product to another country, if you need to spend huge amount of 
transportation cost, conveyance fee, then it is no longer a viable concept to sell this product to another country. Rather, you sell this product within this economy. This increase in transportation cost may be tagged with the idea of tariff or quota. The cost of product modification or adaptation to satisfy the foreign market requirement is very high. If the demand pattern is changing overnight, then it becomes very difficult to change your supply, change the nature of the good to match with the demand for the foreigners. Why it is difficult? It is also costly. So it is better not to satisfy their demand, but it is better to satisfy the domestic demand. It may be that because of government rules and regulations, certain goods are not allowed to export. I can give you one example. Few years ago, there was a kind of an uh, assessment by the government and the implication and the news was there in the media that India is exporting wheat. And then people, some people said that when there is excess demand for wheat in this country, why should this government is exporting same product to another country? We should not do that. So maybe during some time, during crisis, during a requirement, the government may postpone or ban the export of certain commodity or import of certain commodity. So in that case, those goods should be treated as non-traded goods. And important one is that the absence of developed trade channels and lack of realization of trade potential may also lead to the existence of non-traded goods. So non-traded goods is the reality of our life and we cannot ignore this reality if we want to match the trade model with the realistic world. So the question is, what should be the pattern of equilibrium if I club these two things together? Two things means traded and non-traded good. Some basic assumptions we need to follow as you know that all the models in trade theory are essentially based on certain assumptions. It could be general assumption, it could be very uh, specific assumption, it could be restrictive assumption, but without assuming anything, you cannot frame a model because theoretical predictive model cannot take into account everything realistic. So the models that we have here is based on certain assumptions. So what are the assumptions? The country is small. The small country assumption is very interesting in every model of international trade. You know why? Because small country assumption gives you predetermined equilibrium price of the commodity. So small country cannot influence the trade pattern internationally, trade volume internationally, commodity price internationally, because the share of small country is so low that if it enters into the market, or if it leaves the market, it will have no significant effect on the total market transaction of any good or service. So small country has to accept whatever happens in the international market. Small country has to accept the prevailing commodity price. Small country is only allowed to do business on the prevailing international price of any commodity or international terms of trade line. So there are three sectors. Interesting, unlike specific factor model and Ricardian model, we are adding one more sector. One is export sector, another is import sector, and there is another sector. The new one is non-traded sector. And you know, specific factor model, we had what? Two goods, but three factors. Two goods using labor, capital, and land. So two goods, three factors. Here I have three goods and four factors. One is exporting sector means I am producing exportable. Exportable production stands for what? I may not export, but I am producing a commodity that may be exported. On the other hand, I have importing sector. This means importable sector. I am producing a good which can be bought from the international market. So if needed, 
I can import that commodity. So it is importable. The other one is non-traded, neither exported nor imported. Three goods and four factors. In fact, we can club these traded goods and non-traded goods together uh, uh, to define all these three sectors in a single diagram. So what is that? Export sector is traded, import sector is traded, you club them together. You get the traded sector. And on the other axis or other part, you have non-traded sector. So basically, in a two-dimensional diagram, we cannot consider three goods together. So what we can do, we can make a composite good. Composite good is traded good. Traded good has two components. Two components means export good and import good. And on the other hand, I have non-traded good. This is the diagram to show this traded and non-traded good. So in this figure, the vertical axis represents traded goods. And the horizontal axis, you can look at this diagram. Here I have non-traded goods. The country will be at equilibrium in this diagram. As you recall, that the equilibrium takes place at a point where the slope of three things are getting equalized. What are the three things? The slope of the production possibility frontier and the slope of the indifference curve and the price line. So all these three things are at equilibrium at point E in this diagram. And at E, what I have is that ON amount of non-traded good is produced and OT amount of traded good is produced. And this PP line is the price line which represents the relative price of the traded and non-traded good. And this is what we know as the real exchange rate. This real exchange rate is very much the part of the open economy, macroeconomics. I will touch upon that part because of currency appreciation is an important dimension for this non-traded good analysis. Now, Although the non-traded goods are not directly affected by the exogenous factors, what are the exogenous factors? If something happens in the international market and the good that I want to analyze is non-traded, means it is not connected with international transactions. So it is not directly affecting the non-traded good. But since it is affecting the traded good, then some influence will percolate to the non-traded sector. Similarly, when something happens to the non-traded sector, the effect will also go to the traded sector by specific factor model channel. What is that specific channel? I will discuss by giving a simple example. touch upon these things. Dutch disease is a concept that describes an economic phenomenon where the rapid development of one sector of the economy. And in case of the example we cited here, it is the natural gas that precipitates a decline in other sectors. How? I'll explain. This phenomenon of Dutch disease commonly occurs in countries which rely heavily on the export of a particular good. In our example, natural resources or natural gas. The uber dependence on the export of natural resources leads to the underdevelopment of other sectors. But it is very ridiculous to listen that one sector which is completely isolated, that is influencing other sectors and leading to kind of harm that may be irreversible. How funny it is, but that's the reality. Why? Because these, all these sectors are connected to the specific factor model kind of thing. So the Dutch disease term was first introduced in the Economist magazine in 1977 to analyze the economic situation in the Netherlands after the discovery of large natural gas field in 1959. In fact, the model, specific factor model, helped to analyze this Dutch disease phenomenon. And then 
it led to decline in the manufacturing industry in the Netherlands and that led to a kind of problem in the economy as a whole, employment problem, foreign exchange problem and from there we got the name Dutch disease, the problem of the Netherlands, problem of the Dutch. But this phenomenon is very much present in every country. Now it's time to decipher the arguments because I just said that this is the channel that the outcome will happen. But what is the exact channel? Now look at the structure that I developed. There are three goods. All these three goods are using labor, all these three sectors. But all these three sectors are using one factor specific to it and one sector which is non-traded. Non-traded means the distinguishing feature of the non-traded sector is that the price of this sector is not determined in the international market because this good is not exported nor imported. So the price of this commodity or service is determined domestically. So, even if the country concerned is small, it has the capacity to change the commodity price at equilibrium. But for the traded sector, it cannot do. Now, when one sector emerges in the economy, like say natural gas, which is tradable, and there is huge demand for that product. If that happens, what will happen to the system? People will try to produce more of that commodity, say the natural gas. Or say it is a commodity which is software. So people are trying to produce more and more sophisticated softwares. That needs what? That needs labor and capital. Mind it. The same labor is also used in producing car. The same labor is also used in producing rice. The same labor is also used in producing medical equipments. So all these sectors are also going to have some influence. When demand for software increases, that leads to an increase in demand for labor and also for computer. And computer is specific. So the return to computer will definitely increase as I explained in my previous module in specific factor model. But at the same time, demand for labor will also increase that will lead to an increase in wage rate. The interesting part is that the same labor is also used in all other sectors. In all other sectors, the labor price also goes up. So if the another factor used in those sectors are not willing to accept a fall in their price, then the total cost of production will increase. If the cost of production increases, but the price is determined in the international market for the traded good, then higher cost of production compared to the price will lead to non-viability of that sector and that sector has to shut down. So that is called a kind of deindustrialization of the economy. But at the same time, if there is a commodity which is non-traded, non-traded means if labor price goes up, the cost of production going up, you raise the commodity price because the commodity price is not determined in the international market. So it is in your control. Domestically, you can raise the price of that commodity. So that sector will survive, but not the traded sector. So emergence of a new sector, booming sector, may cause the existing export sector on which your economy may rely, that sector may vanish from the system, and that may lead to a severe problem for the economy as a whole. So that's the crucial implication of the existence of Dutch disease kind of phenomenon. And at the same time, what may happen? That this kind of increase in new sector output, more output production of the new sector for which the demand is high in the international market may lead to increase in the foreign exchange reserve. If there is increase in the foreign exchange reserve, 
then there would be currency appreciation. Students, you will get to know more about this currency appreciation and foreign exchange market in another module, in another course. But the point is that if you earn more, foreign exchange reserve will rise, the currency will appreciate. The currency will appreciate means your exportable commodity is becoming costlier and your importable is becoming cheaper. Why? That will be explained in a different module. But the point is that if my exportable is costlier now, my export will fall because the foreigner will not buy my product. If my importable is cheaper, then I will import more because it is now cheaper. So eventually there would be a severe balance of payment problem because I am importing more, I am buying more and selling less. That may not sustain. Students, you remember the same thing happened during mercantilism. Mercantilism emphasized on more export and less import. More export means you are earning more and spending less. So your foreign exchange reserve goes up. Then eventually your export becomes costlier and import was cheaper. So that was not sustained. So the same thing may also happen and may lead to deindustrialization through the channels I explained a few couple of minutes ago. So in diagrammatic format, let me very quickly give you a snapshot of what may happen. You know, in equilibrium, the price should be equal to the marginal cost of production. You know, cost of production in a competitive setup. How much you spend to produce the good, you will get that much money as the price. Because otherwise, either you will earn super normal profit or you will not survive. So if you earn super normal profit, more firms will come in and the super normal profit will vanish from the system. So here what is happening? My upward rising curve, the bold curve, thick curve is the marginal cost curve. And the equilibrium takes place at point B. And what is the implication of point B? At the price given at P bar, you are producing OA amount of output. So when labor cost goes up, your average cost going up, your marginal cost will also go up. And your marginal cost going up means I'm measuring marginal cost along the vertical axis, students, you remember. So my marginal cost curve will shift up. If my marginal cost curve shifts up and I want to have OA as the equilibrium output, then what should be the equilibrium point? Instead of B, C should be the equilibrium point. This equilibrium point at C implies higher price, but that cannot be afforded because this price is given in the international market and this international price is given to the small economy. So you cannot change this P bar. If you keep this P bar here, then what is happening? The equilibrium takes place at this point, the dotted line and your output contracts. So the exportable sector must contract because of an increase in cost of production due to the emergence of a new sector reflecting the phenomenon called Dutch phenomenon. So is it true that we may have Dutch disease kind of phenomenon in India? Yes, we may have. Because emergence of software industry, emergence of IT sector may lead to an increase in cost of production for labor, maybe informal labor, maybe unskilled labor in all other sectors of the economy. Now think of informal sector in the economy. Think of the cottage industry. Think of the bamboo industry. Think of those people who are working at a very low wage in the economy and producing something and selling this thing domestically at a very low price. If the cost of production goes up, then it is almost impossible for them to survive. For whom? The product producer of those tiny goods. The producer in the informal sector who are selling bamboo tokery in the local market. In fact, all of you probably know there is an interesting act which is called Manrega. Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, because of the existence of Manrega, the wage in the rural sector has gone up. And as a result of that, the cost of production in the agricultural sector is increasing. But the price of agricultural produce is not increasing. And that is why this sector is suffering. Maybe the agricultural sector may have to face kind of vanishing sector kind of argument or may, may shut down. So government has to be very careful for this because the agriculture sector produces and supplies food for the entire economy. So until and unless agriculture price goes up to sustain with this increasing cost, to match with the increasing cost, this sector will vanish and that is not good for the economy as a whole. So the conclusion of Dutch disease kind of phenomenon and you can message that you can take with you 
are very interesting and I am briefly mentioning these two, three things. The every country produces goods which cannot be traded at all. This is the thing that I mentioned. Because of their nature, it may be uh, because of trade policies and other issues. There may be artificial trade barriers that may lead to the existence of non-traded sector. And the phenomenon that we have described here is called Dutch disease. This explains how a favorable change in the condition affecting one tradable sector can adversely affect other tradable sectors by squeezing their profits. Squeezing their profits, why? Because the cost of production is increasing. If the cost of production goes up, a squeeze in the profit is nothing but the indication that this sector should close down. This sector should stop producing the output. And for a small open economy, an increase in cost may successfully be passed on to the consumers in sectors protected from the foreign competition. Means if the sector is non-traded, just you take into account the increase in cost, you raise the price and you survive. But if the sector is traded, you cannot survive. And that's all about the implication of Dutch disease and the specific factor model in international trade theory. Thank you very much.